everyone, welcome. Thank you for coming and for registering and uh, it's wonderful. We actually have 70, about 70 people registered. Hopefully that many people won't show up because <laughs> we want to have as much uh, broadband as we can, but um, I think it'll be fine if they do all show up. But I, I, know, I know for a fact that most people are just waiting for the recording. Um, I offered this for, people are asking me, why are you offering for free? You never do anything for free. Um, and I thought that this would be good because I do offer free, usually I do offer free demos, but I haven't been able to do that because of COVID. Um, so I haven't done that for two years. And I thought I would give people an opportunity to get the same demonstration for free. Um, so you guys are the lucky recipients. So uh, first, before we get started, what I'm going to do is um, talk to you a little bit about some upcoming workshops I have, and then I'd like to start with a just a very brief, brief encaustic history, and then we'll get into take a short break. Please mute yourselves, um, and we'll take a short break, and very short break, just a bathroom break or to get some water or something like that, and we'll come back for questions. All right, and again, you can put those questions in the chat um, if they are. Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> Leslie says awesome. Um, yeah, if, if there are really, in, I'll go through the chat every once in a while. Probably when I come back from the break, I'll go through the chat and answer those questions first, and then we'll answer uh, any other questions you might have. Um, you can unmute yourselves and ask them. If there's something that is really like happening that's awful that needs to be addressed right away, um, just unmute yourself and say, Lorraine, Lorraine, something's happening. I need, to, you know, whatever. I'll, um, I need to address that right away. Like if you can't see or something's happening that's uh, that I don't know, that I'm clearly not aware of. All right, so let's get started. I'm going to actually share my screen now so that you can see what's on there. Um, all right, hold on a second. Technology. Ay, ay, ay. All right, share desktop. All right, so you should be able to see my desktop right now. I am going to talk to you first about, so some of, for some of you, a lot of you have taken this workshop with me already, or taken a workshop with me, or have had workshops already, um, and you're just doing this today for a review, and that's awesome. But I want to let you know that I am offering a virtual um, workshop called Beyond the Basics. So what I'm going to do in that one, and that's happening in April, and it's three uh, three days. It's a Tuesday, a Thursday, and another Tuesday. And that one is going, and it's happening um, 5th, 7th, and 12th. It's going to be recorded. You get the recordings for each day um, if you can't make it. I am offering this to you, to people who are registered for this, at $400, it's regularly $450, $400 for one week following this workshop, okay? So one week from now, you can sign up at $400. Anytime after that, it's gonna be at $450. Um, and I do that because I've only, I didn't promote this. I've only sent this out to people who are on my list and who are a part of my group on Facebook. You're the only people that know about this. And I do that because you guys are supporters of mine. You are direct supporters of mine. And I appreciate that. And I wanted to let you know that. So um, I'm offering this to you. Now, what am I doing in this workshop? Um, I'm not going to go through reading it. You can actually go there and you'll get a link to this uh, workshop page. But I do want to tell you, it is a very in-depth um, delve into of collage, color mixing, layering, working with translucency. That's one of the basic things that I see happening all the time with people is their lack of understanding or their lack of use or take advantage of the translucency of wax. And um, I think a lot of people tell me they have problems with that. And so this is gonna be part, that's one day. And then the next time is collage. And then uh, the third day we uh, look at, um, scraping and other kind of comprehensive things um, that involve layers 
and things like that. And we also gonna talk a lot about composition and just delve into a little bit more of the basics, uh, but delve into them um, pretty deeply. Um, so you could read about that. We talk about tools. I talk about other tools besides what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and you can see some of the work. I've taught this workshop for many years uh, beyond the basics. Um, I taught it for many years in person. So you can see some of the work that people have made uh, in that class. I love this piece. Oh, I just love that. I don't know who did it, I forget, but that was just awesome. So um, the next one I wanna let you know about is Reach. Two retreats happening um, this summer in Vermont. Uh, Vermont is one of my favorite places to go. And I always take advantage of Vermont's landscape. It's just I, it's just beautiful, the sky, everything. Uh, I did this last year with Leah McDonald and Dietland Vanderschaff. And Dietland and I are teaching in June in Vermont. And I am doing a workshop in July. Let's do that one first. We'll do this one first. This is one happening in July. This is um, Leah McDonald with Photography, the Figure, and Encaustic. Um, this was absolutely fabulous. This was our model, Nikki. Um, and it was fantastic where, where we actually insert the model into the landscape, take pictures, and then we add encaustic over that. And, and Leah <clears throat> is fantastic to work with. She's a lot of fun, and um, we had a great time. So and what the, it's actually taking place at a place called LaRue Inn, or LaRue, it's pronounced LaRue Inn. Um, and we, uh, we just love it there. The food there is fantastic. You get breakfast and lunch as part of your accommodation. Um, it is $1,800 uh, for everything, your accommodations, your food, um, minus some dinners uh, for the food, but most people didn't care about that. Um, so, and, and for the workshop. So everything is included in that $1,800. I'm offering this to you for $100 off for one week following this workshop. Okay, so you guys got a lot of deals coming. Um, got a lot of things to make decisions about. So right here is our daily schedule. Um, we had a, a ton of fun. We spent a full day with Nikki, our, our model. And then we uh, spend the next two and a half days working with Encaustic in the studio. And you also have night studio hours that are optional too, because we're staying right there. Everything's right there. It is a full retreat. You, no one else is in the building except for us. Um, just the class is there. It's, it's really kind of, it's quiet. It's lovely here. Are some pictures of the, of the place. There's a barn. It's just, it's just your typical Vermont farm. Um, there is a fire pit. We do start out with a fire pit uh, during, on the first day. Look at the view. That is the view from the Mad River, which is right next to the inn. It's just, we went swimming in the river every day last time. Uh, just fantastic. So here, here's some of Leah's work uh, that you can look at um, when you get a chance. Leah's She's pretty much the uh, photo encaustic. Uh, she's one of those people who put it on the map pretty much. She's been working in it for a very long time. And uh, even before encaustic was a thing. So um, all the things that you need to know are here. Here's some work that people did in the workshop last year uh, that I'll just flip through. And we will be getting Nikki again as our model she's just lovely i don't know why some of these aren't loading that's where actually where the workshop is held it's held in the event pavilion of the at the inn where they usually have wedding receptions um this is us we were set up here for the workshop in the picture it's just it's lovely uh it's outdoors um very large area to allow for spacing and uh, other things. So these are just some photographs. So um, there's that workshop. So hopefully that sparked some interest. The next one is abstracting the landscape. Um, and I'm teaching, and this is in plain air. We're gonna be working in plain air out in the, in, the, in the wilderness. There's walking trails right there too by the inn. So this is with uh, Kelly Malukas. Um, some of you might know Kelly, she's fabulous. I think she might even be on this call. If you are Kelly, just yell out 
<laughs> she actually registered for this, but I don't know if she's going to come to the call. So uh, Kelly is not a beginner. She was simply here to uh, as some moral support. Kelly has been teaching for a really long time. She's excellent at breaking down the outdoors into abstraction. So if you're interested in landscape and abstraction, this is the class to take. Um, um, we're going to be working out again, out in the, we're going to go to different places. There's water, there's meadow, and there is forest. So, and same with the other photography one, we're going to be doing all that too, water, meadow, and forest. So we're going to be uh, sitting in those different places and then abstracting those different places, learning how to break them down and then working with encaustic um, as well. So it's going to be a really fun class. Um, I'm excited. This is our first time teaching it, but um, I'm, I don't choose people. I choose people to teach with um, very carefully. I, I do um, spend some time looking at people and what they can offer the workshop and what they can offer, how we can balance our, our teaching skills. Here's some more pictures of the place. This is um, Peter, the kitty. He visited us in all the workshops and took play. He was a very good student. Uh, some food and things that we um, had. The food is, I can't even tell you, it's a, it's a working farm. So all the food there is, is that they, that they uh, serve us is made right there and made from the um, farm grown um, fruits and vegetables and, and other things there. So there's some pictures of Kelly's work. Oops, I skipped it. Yeah, here's some landscapes that she did breaking things down, just fabulous. Most of it is in, I think it's all in caustic. Um, so you can take a look at that. Again, you'll get these links. Um, and then some images of, of some of the classes that were taught last year at LaRue, as well as some of more of Kelly's work. I don't know why sometimes these don't load when there's other things happening. So hopefully you'll get, you'll get those pictures up um, on your own computer when not as, there it is. Not as many people are on here, but there's Kelly. She's got the best personality, just hilarious and fun to work with. Here's some work that she was doing. Um, here's her in plain air, just like George O'Keefe in her car <laughs> with her pastels. <laughs> just love her. Uh, here's a class that she was teaching. Um, I'm not sure where uh, this was, but that's what you'll look like if you take the class. There's Kelly again, dueling torches. All right, so there's me. That's me sketching uh, in Vermont. It's what I love to do. It's my most, most favorite thing to do is to climb and then get my sketchbook out and look down and sketch. Um, here's another work of Kelly's. Here's a, this is a workshop at LaRue with Dietlin. You can see Dietlin's happy face over there. Um, and this plein air workshop, by the way, is happening in August. So you can see, I think it's 11th to 15th. I believe that's what it is, but you have, we'll have to confirm those dates. This is the, actually the woods. There's a walking trail right behind LaRue um, as well. So you can check those pictures out. Uh, also some work that students did in both classes uh, with me and Kelly on that site. Okay, good. Um, so while we're sharing the screen very quickly, what I'm gonna do is just do a brief, I think this is it, yep, this is it. Just do a brief history of encaustic. It, um, just for those of you who don't know, it does have a rich history. Some of you might be aware of it. Some of you might not be aware of it. I like to start out by doing a brief history um, because it's very interesting. Um, so the use of encaustic is thought to have begun in ancient Greece around 800 BC. Um, and this is when shipbuilders actually began using wax to caulk their joints in the, in the ship and waterproof um, those areas as well. And they used red um, a lot of times to decorate the bow of the ship to scare off their, I guess it's supposed to represent blood. These are the, these are the this is the blood of our enemies on the front of our ship. Uh, so I, I guess it was supposed to scare off their, their Enemies. So that was kind of the first pigmented wax usage was was to scare off enemies. I think that's that's kind of fabulous. Um, so 
next from there, the pigmented wax, Greek artists incorporated it into their easel painting or used it to polychrome um, marble sculptures. And you can actually see an example of this on this vase at the Metropolitan Museum. Um, there is the, oops, you guys probably can't see it. If you close your, there, I'm gonna just move it out of the way. There you go. That's the artist right there. And he's got his paintbrush right there. This is the statue that is being polychromed. And then here's an assistant. So they didn't have electricity there. So this assistant is handing brushes as they melt, just handing off, just kind of doing this kind of, kind of this thing. As soon as they cool off, he gets a hot one. As soon as they cool off, he gets a hot one. So on and on and on and on, fascinating way of working. Uh, we take our electricity very, very much for granted. When you look at things like that, we see how we take things for granted. Uh, so the earliest surviving examples of encaustic painting are the Fayum portraits, okay? Oop. And there they go. They were set, um, they were made from Greco-Roman Egypt, ranging from about 100 BC to 200 AD. The uh, Fayum portraits are named after the region of Egypt called the Fayum Desert. And these survived in tombs um, virtually unscathed they because they were in airless sunless tombs um, that proves how how um, tough encaustic is people always say it's so fragile it's, so fra it's really not I mean it will melt obviously it will melt at 200 degrees and I always tell people if your uh, encaustic paintings are melting then you have a lot of problems more problems than just worrying about your art uh, in your house so uh, that's they are tough, they can survive, and um, this proves it. So this group of portraits actually traveled um, from the Metropolitan Museum all the way to Europe, and it was a 10-year journey, and it was supposed to come back. That. Please mute yourselves. Not sure who that is, but I can hear lots of noise. Um, please mute yourselves. Uh, so actually, it traveled to Europe. It was supposed to come back to the Met, but I think uh, in 2020, I believe that's when it was supposed to come back. So, um, but because of COVID, it, I don't think it has, but look for that at the Met coming soon. Cause I think it's kind of returned and we're gonna see these portraits again. If you didn't get a chance to see it the first time it was at the Met. So that's exciting. So you can see the paintings were done on wood set into mummy casings. You can see they're actually set in to where the, the to uh, replicate the person who is sitting in, in, in the uh, tomb. Please mute yourselves. Um, okay. Over 600 of these portraits survive. I don't know who's unmuted, but I can hear and it's kind of distracting. So please mute yourselves. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is another. Um, you can see how lovely these are. Actually, the skin, the translucency of the wax, um, is is just so fantastic for skin. And they they really did a great job. So this is Greco-Roman Egypt. Um, so with less laborious painting practice, this is one of my favorite ones. And then I actually found this one too. I, I love her. I just think this is so fabulous. Um, they also used gold uh, leaf around the head and around the outside of the head to replicate or to replicate, to signify or to symbolize passing on into another world. So that's what that, that actually means. Um, and they're just be beautiful. I hope you get a chance to see them in person if they come back to the Met. So with less laborious painting, painting um, practices and methods, you know, oil painting and things like that, and cost to kind of dwindled um, and in about 700 AD. And it didn't come back in any notable sense until about, um, well, 1955, we know Jasper Johns, uh, you know, had a, had a seminal show, but there was other, you know, some pretty uh, other uh, famous people who used it. Diego Rivera actually used it. Um, 
and you know, there's a few others, but uh, in the 1920s, he made, he did actually murals out of it, which is fantastic. So, um, so yeah, so there it is. That's very brief. Um, again, very brief. And I will go into this with beyond the basics. I will do a more substantial talk about, um, about encaustic and its history. Okay, so let me just check the chat. I see, yes, thank you for muting. I, I, that was getting really distracting. So let's, so you can see me. I don't know if it's important to see me, but I'll keep me on if, you, if you're tired of looking at me or you can't, you know, can't see something big enough or whatever, uh, I'll take myself off. Just, just let me know um, and we'll, we'll do that. Okay, so let's get started. Let's talk about first, and I'm, this is this is basic. So we are going to talk about what encaustic actually is, and this is where right here, this demo screen is where I'm going to be most of the time. Okay, you can see my palette, you can see me. I think it helps to see me um, doing things at the same time that you can see my hands moving here. It's almost like you're there, kind of, <laughs> but not really. Okay, so if you look here, this is what encaustic actually is. It is a mixture of beeswax, okay? This is real beeswax there, and Damar resin, okay? Damar resin is a um, sap from a tree in the East Indies. I think it's the East Indies. Um, and if you smell it, it smells rather sweet. It's actually used in aromatherapy. Um, but in encaustic, there are three reasons why we put it in there, and I'll give you those in a second. So these two things, the, the Damar resin and the beeswax come together and make medium, all right? That's what we call encaustic medium. It is the clear stuff. It is non-color, doesn't have any color in it. And when pigment, dry pigment is added to the medium, that's when we get our encaustic colors, okay? This is medium, it is beeswax, damar resin, and dried pigment, and that's what makes up the pigment, okay? So we say encaustic pigment and encaustic medium, that's what those things are, all right? So reasons why we have the damar resin in there, and there are several recipes, you all probably know there are different recipes, different proportions that you can do. I think the average is, is four to one, uh, wax to to uh, resin, but I don't I don't know I, I don't really don't pay attention to that. It's too much math. Um, please mute yourselves. Thank you. Um, so, anyways, we can talk more about that. But there's three reasons why we use the Demar resin. A lot of people don't use it. Now, just to say, a lot of people don't. The resin is actually in their pigment always if they're purchasing it from R and F. It's always in there but um, they choose not to use it in their medium. Some people do, they don't like the smell of it, whatever the case, but there are reasons why it's in. Now the three are, the first, it strengthens the wax, okay? It actually gives it a little bit of oomph. Uh, if you touch beeswax by itself without the resin in it, the beeswax itself is kind of sticky, kind of soft, um, so this gives it a little bit of strength. You add too much resin, that's what might come, becomes brittle. So you don't want to add too much. You want to stay within the acceptable ranges of, of ratios of wax to resin. Okay. Um, so it does strengthen it. Another thing it does is it raises the melting point a little bit, okay, and allows it to be more workable. Um, also allows it to be a better painting too. I mean, you don't want to be wandering around with sticky sticky paintings in your house uh, that are attracting dust. And um, it allows it to, to raise the melting point, melting point, making it a little bit more workable, but also allows it to be buffed. Okay, so you have that nice eggshell finish, lovely eggshell finish. Okay, and then third thing that it does, third thing that resin does is it cuts down on something called bloom, which uh, you probably have, have seen if you have chocolate in your house too long, it's that whitish powdery stuff that kind of clings. Um, that's what can happen to paints sometimes, certain paints like blacks, a lot of times because there's bone in black. Um, it can have, a, it's a chemical reaction basically that's just occurring in the wax. 
Can I please? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was me. Um, yeah. So yeah, so that can actually happen in paintings. Bloom can happen in paintings if you don't have the resin in there and if you're working with specific colors. So, and I have seen this happen before when, when before I actually took classes and knew what I was doing with encaustic, um, a couple of my paintings bloomed. And uh, it's just, if it does happen, if, you, if you've made some paintings that you didn't know what you were doing like me, just tell your people to wipe it off. First, fortunately, I had just given those paintings to friends and they just contacted me and said, you know, there's some white stuff on my painting. I was like, I'll just take a soft cloth and just, just get rid of it. But you don't want to be telling people that. So you want to have a little bit of resin in your medium. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so there's that. So let's talk about basic tools. If you're getting started in encaustic and you just want to get the basic stuff first, it doesn't have to be super expensive. A lot of people get really freaked out because the paint itself is expensive. Yes, it is. Um, but it doesn't have to be expensive as far as what you're purchasing. So you can see my palette over here. Um, it is a Presto. It's called Presto Tilt and Drain big griddle. That's what it's called. That's the title of it. Everybody asks me what I use because I, this is actually bigger than most of your pancake griddles. If you don't want to buy the big one, if you don't have room in it in your for it in your studio, you can buy any kind of pancake griddle or any kind of flat surfaced cooking thing. Some people have asked about warming trays. Warming trays don't get hot enough. Um, they really don't. They only go to about 150. Um, those are things that people that they use in, in restaurants to keep things warm. Um, they don't get warm enough. I, I, I've worked with them and, and you, they might be good for monoprints. If anyone is interested in doing monoprints, they, um, you don't want to go as high as 200 degrees for monoprints. So you can use your, more, your warming trays for that. But for painting, you want to get something that can go to at least 200 degrees and stay hot at that, at that, at that temperature. Uh, other things that you will use. Heated irons. Um, I'm in love with this iron. This is the Clover Mini Iron. We'll talk about this a little bit when we talk about collage uh, at the end of this presentation. I'm also in love with this one. This is the, G the Dritz Petite Press. Okay. This this and all the other things that I'm talking about are on sale at my Amazon store. And I will give you a link to that. It's called uh, Everything in Caustic. And everything that I talk about is on there on Amazon. So you don't really have to write anything down. It's all there. Uh, if you want to go elsewhere to buy these things, you can get them at Michael's. You can get them at Joann's. I've seen uh, the, the Clover Mini Iron and the Dritz Petit Press there. Um, Joann's, Michael's, uh, Hobby Lobby, sometimes I've seen them there too. Um, I don't use a regular heat gun. I use this thing. This is an embossing heat tool. Also, you can purchase at Amazon on my store as well as Joann's and Michael's, okay? This is for embossing powders, all right? The reason I don't use a heat gun, I think they're, they're heavy and clunky, to be honest. They're really expensive too. And I don't use a heat gun very often for the things that I do. I mostly use a torch. Um, heat, but all of these things, the torch, the heat guns, and the irons all have their place in certain things that you're doing. Okay, they all have their uses. All right, so you probably want to get one of each. Just saying. Um, other things that you will need, brushes. Um, Let's see. Oh, also want to mention uh, RNF's heated palette as well. A little bit pricier than a griddle, obviously, but they're really great in the fact that they are stain. They're they're sort of a grayish color, so that you can see your colors a little bit more um, clearer as far as what the color looks like. They are smooth and allow for. Um, they're adjustable too. The, the feet are adjustable. So if you're tipping like this, you can adjust the feet. Um, they're actually really, there's just a, a deluxe pancake griddle pretty much, um, but they're lovely. I have one as well of those. They're great for monoprinting. They're really good for monoprinting because they have that beautiful flat surface. So um, there it is. So you also, going back to the griddles, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my, I'm going off a little bit of my outline. I need to stick to it. Um, 
So regardless of the pallet that you buy, whether you buy a pancake griddle or not, you um, want to make sure that you can control the temperature. Okay. And um, after we're finished talking about tools, we'll talk about safety um, because that's also something that you need to pay attention to. So griddle, some heated tools. I also forgot about the torch. Now this isn't pretty much an advanced thing. Um, if you wanted to get by with just the basics, you want to get your heat gun or embossing tool and an iron. Um, the torch can come later. This is also on Amazon along with the gas. Uh, okay, so I, I really love the torch and some of the times people in my beginners classes don't like torches. I don't even bring them. I bring like one and people can use them, but um, in the Beyond the basics, I usually bring one for everybody because I try to get them on the torch. Once you're on the torch, you never want to get off the torch because it's it's fabulous. But if you're afraid or if you don't want to try it, no worries. You don't have to. You can do other things. Um, you want to be able to control the temperature of your griddle. You want to be able to control the temperature of all of your heated tools. OK, um, and we'll talk about temperature in a moment. You can also get Again, not particularly necessary, but something that we always recommend is getting a temperature gauge or a thermometer. You can get cheaper ones at, um, at your store that just kind of lay on top of the griddle, the tail of the temperature, and you can kind of move them around. This is a fancy um, digital temperature gauge. Frankly, I never use them. Uh, I, I don't, I just kind of trust that the temperature's fine and continue with my day. I, you know, there's lots of things you can get sort of bogged down in within caustic, but uh, you know, like the, like the ratio of your, of your medium, that's to me, it just seems a little, ugh, I'll, I'll leave that to the paint makers, but um, you know, things like temperature and things like that, while it's very important to know, I mean, if you're, if your wax is smoking, you need to know what's going on there. Um, but it, you know, a lot of people get obsessed with the temperature all over their griddle and it's not necessary to do that to, in my opinion. Um, okay, so next thing. So let's get back to brushes. So we have heated irons, heated tools, griddles. Um, brushes you can get, I recommend two kinds. The cheaper ones are your hog, hogs bristle brushes. All right, these are kind of, stiff they're very cheap they're also called chip brushes um you can go to home depot and get a pack you can go anywhere and get a pack of these things uh if you want to go the cheap this is what you want um if you want to get a little bit of an upgrade I, these will also put a lot of texture in your work uh, sometimes that texture may be unwanted so I kind of recommend these for the very, very beginner person who is just testing it out, just testing out encaustic, just kind of seeing what you like, um, just splashing some, some wax around. They're fabulous, okay? If you wanna get into it and you know you like it, um, I go with the Hake, Hakey brushes, H-A-K-E. I think I'm saying it right, Hakey brushes. These are made with goat's hair, they're softer, they tend to hold a lot more wax. They're nicer. They're not much more expensive than the hogs bristle brushes, to be honest. They're really not that much more expensive. Um, and they're nicer. They're just, they don't put a lot of unwanted crap, <laughs> crap texture in your work. Um, but they have a lot more hairs. The cheaper ones will sort of leave hairs in your, in your work, but that's just a thing. That you'll have to deal with. Also, dust gets in your work, so that's just another thing. But you can get a pack of these at um, at Michaels as well, too, uh, pretty cheaply. I, you know, I got off the hog, hogs bristle as soon as I found that I could get cheaper ones, cheaper hakey brushes at uh, hobby stores and things like that. You can also get them on Amazon in packs as well, pretty cheaply. Amazon's the savior for everybody for everything. Um, we don't like that, but there it is, unfortunately. Next things that you'll want to get are things to hold your paint. Um, and this is what I use. I use these. These are small, these are mini creme brulee, disposable mini creme brulee thingies. Um, I do want to say RNF, Richard at RNF does not recommend 
the disposables for anything because they are aluminum and they sort of react with the paint and may discolor certain paints like whites and your medium sometimes will get discolored. I don't notice it too much happening um, to me. So, and I've always used these and I like them. You can, you can bend them and make little spouts so that you can pour. So I really like them for that reason. You can also get r and um, and uh, let's put the bow. Please mute yourselves. You can also get RNFs pans. These are made out of stainless steel. They're really nice. Um, but you know, I can't bend them and make a spout, but they're super nice. They won't discolor anything. Okay. Um, you saw what I was using too. You want to get some some of these um, clothes pins to kind of move things around on your palette, kind of fancy. Um, it's not super fancy, but I actually bought these. These are awesome. These are, I found these in a cooking store. I love these. This is just for grabbing things out of the oven, but they're great for moving things around and on the palette. And they protect your hands and you can pick them up and whatever. Um, I do want to say, and I haven't, I usually preface this by saying there are vast differences in the way certain people work. I work differently from, from many people, okay? Um, and uh, I work differently, other people work differently, some people do things very differently. I just wanna say that there are many, many differences to the way people work. Please mute yourselves, please check your mute. Even if you muted yourself before, check yourself that you are muted because a lot of times people will mute and un un inadvertently press the thing that, and, and I think I just muted somebody, so good. All right, so those, you also wanna get things, the last things you wanna get is mark making tools. So, and you can collect those as you go. Sometimes people just like to get things to write into the wax or to draw into the wax. You do wanna get a scraper. Those are important. I like the, the pear shaped or the triangular shaped clay scraper or a razor blade will work. So, those are your basic, basic, basics. Okay, let's go over that list again. A heated iron, a, a heated um, heat tool of some sort, or, or a heat gun, a griddle, temperature gauge, um, brushes, something to hold the wax in, and some possibly some scraping tools and some incising tools. Okay, that's in addition to uh, some of the other things I'm going to be talking about the paint, the medium, and that kind of thing. It seems like a lot it seems like, oh my gosh, I have to get so many things. But you can't like I said, you can get it on the cheap, you can get some of this, you can get used as well. I see on eBay, sometimes people buy all the stuff, and they never use it. And they sell the whole thing like their griddle, and their waxes and their brushes and everything at one big price, um, one sometimes pretty cheap price. So keep looking on eBay and uh, Facebook Marketplace for stuff like that. Also on some of the encaustic groups, people will sell things. So keep your eyes out for that if you're looking for bargains. All right, so those are really good places. So any questions so far? Let me check the chat. If you have questions so far, I think it's been just yelling at people. <laughs> Yeah, the, the RNF containers do clean up really well. Okay, great. Um, all right, so next things, let's talk about work surfaces, all right? So again, another place you can go on the cheap. So what I'm gonna be working on today are encaustic boards um, made by ampersand um, and RNF combined together to create this encaustic board. And it's, it's made with, I think it's made with a rabbit skin glue um, based or chalk based um, I, uh, gesso so that it can actually grip and hold the wax. You don't wanna buy anything that has acrylic gesso already on it. Some people make a lot of mistakes by doing that. Anything with acrylic gesso or acrylic based anything will not work with encaustic. Some people have told me, oh, well, I made a painting that, you know, the encaustic clung to the acrylic really well. You may, may well have done that um, and, and kudos, but it's not going to last. That's the problem. It will eventually chip off. 
And if you, it may take five years, it may take 10 years, but eventually that painting will not last. It will, it will crumble to the ground. So um, you can't see my workspace. Um, I don't know if it's real, it's called rabbit skin glue. <laughs> so I'm not sure. I'm not sure that RNF does use rabbit skin glue uh, or what they use for their, um, for their gessos, but I do know it's chalk based so that it's not going, it's not acrylic based. That's, there's the difference there. It is something that is, is, um, will be able to, um, now some people were saying they can't see my workspace. If you can't see my workspace, make sure you're in view, speaker view. Okay. Cause I've spotlighted myself, my palette and my workspace. Okay. If you can't see it, after doing that, okay, good. Everyone can, I think most people can see, make sure you're in speaker view. If you can't see it, I did have a, a problem with this one time teaching a class that uh, the person that couldn't see it, we found out didn't have the most up-to-date operating system on the computer or didn't have the most up-to-date um, Zoom. So if you don't have your most up-to-date Zoom, you might not be able to see it. Okay, most people it seems can see it. I know the poor bunnies. I don't. I don't know. I don't use rapid skin glue for that. I, I'm a vegetarian. I don't use any kind of animal anything. I try not to. I use animal. I use horse hair in my work, but the horse is is alive, and we don't. Yeah, it's a. I always think about it as a symbiosis between you know collaboration between me and the horse, um, uh, as as a work of art between us. So, um, at any rate, um, okay. Work surfaces. So I am using an RNF board. Also, things that I do use, I love to use is wood. I just love to use plain old wood. And you can get wooden painting panels all over the place. You can get them, and they they all range in quality. And um, and that that would just get too crazy. But I know that Dick Blick makes their own. I know they have like a, a professional grade and a student grade. You know, it's up to you what you want to get. You can get cheap, really cheap ones at at michael's painting panels that are pretty smooth you can also go really really cheap and go to home depot and just get wood from there some places will cut cut the wood to your size some places you just have to buy the wood and then cut it when you get home or maybe have a partner or uh, someone who works with wood tools or maybe you work with wood to tools yourself and you can do it yourself so those are uh, some of the things i use i for samples and things like that, I just buy these from my artist and craftsman supply store in Philadelphia. Um, they're awesome. They make some elephant, Apollon elephant panels is what their brand is what they sell in the store. And that's what I use exclusively. I actually went online. I don't know if they're making them anymore. I, have to, I haven't been in the store in, in a long time, but um, you know, I know because of COVID, a lot of times, a lot of things aren't, aren't available now. So I'm not quite sure if, if you have an artist and craftsman in your area. Um, yeah, so um, you can check with them to see, but you also have Dick Blick and all the other places. Um, pressure treated, I think I saw someone ask about pressure treated wood. No, don't use that. Um, I, that can emit things. Yeah, that can emit gases and things like that that are not good, especially if you're using their, your torch on it, um, that it, you, you don't want to. I, I didn't know about that. And I was using all kinds of wood um, and pressure treated and everything. And someone said, don't, don't, that could be really toxic for you. So don't use pressure treated. You want to get, I always make sure that I'm getting the right thing by going to the store and talking to people and making sure that it's just a birch birch wood panel okay i don't surface prep my word my wood panels no i like the wood i like the warmth of the wood you can see the difference in the color when i lay it on top of the white now a lot of people do like to gesso their panels and that's great some of the things that that, that cuts down on is uh, gessoing actually will take care of those little tiny bubbles some of you've worked in encaustic will get little the air that is emitted from the wood creates bubbles on the surface um, of your wax paintings and and until you get a few layers on there that will get on every it gets on people's nerves it really i know from working in encaustic that when i have certain amount of layers on there that those 
bubbles really don't pay. I don't mind them. I really don't mind them at all. So some people it gets on their nerves. It will, won't, gessoing the surface of the wood won't get rid of those bubbles exclusively, but it will cut down on them considerably. Another reason why people gesso and they like a white, they like a white background. Um, and that is, you know, that's preference. You know, sometimes I would prefer a white background and I do just on my panel or I just use one that is already made for me um, by buying an encaustic board. Okay. And I do recommend um, RNF's gesso. It works fabulously. It's great. So that's what I use if I want to wait, if I want white. Um, so that's what you're going to use. You're going to use something that is rigid, especially if you're working with collage. Uh, you can work with paper too. Um, so, so these are all anything absorbent, anything that's going to absorb and hold the wax. Okay. Cling, cling. Um, so, you know, certain papers that might be coated in certain starches might not work as others, but experimenting with your papers, you know, that could take a lifetime. So we could take the whole class for that. Uh, okay. But you do want to work with something rigid. You do want to work with something that isn't going to bend. So people ask about uh, canvas. Canvas is not really suitable for encaustic because it will eventually need to be restretched. I mean, we're talking, you know, 50 years or whatever. That, um, it starts to sag, and that will make your painting crack. Okay, so I don't, I don't recommend canvas. Um, you, so some other things that that you can use, especially for working with sculpture. Um, plaster, stone, uh, terracotta, cast paper, all of these things are acceptable work surfaces. So let's prep a board first and I'll talk about fusing. Oh, you know what? I skipped, I skipped safety. So sorry. I saw that I did that, but let's talk about safety before I go into anything else. So another thing you're going to need for your, um, studio is some kind of natural or, or filtered air, you know, something that, that is allowing for um, air to come through, um, air filtration or some kind of uh, air that's getting into your studio. Now, um, what am I looking for? The word I'm looking for, <laughs> Never mind. air. So uh, I'm right by a window, you can see that. I used to put just one of those window fans in when I was working that, that kind of blows the air out. Um, you want to set up your studio such that you are here and the air is going away from you, okay, pulled out away from you. In other words, you don't want to be here with your wax and the air being pulled behind you like that because then it has to go through you to leave. Um, you want it pulled away from you, okay, so that's how you want to set up your studio. You can also see here that I have a Ventafume right here. It's not on right now because people can't hear me. Um, I do have a window over here that's cracked. Uh, not necessarily the healthiest thing, but when I'm doing these virtuals, you know, it's my health that I'm taking, <laughs> I'm taking um, away from me, but I, it's fine. I'm fine. Um, so these are great. These, these are awesome. The Ventifumes, I love them. They are portable. Um, you can actually move them around the studio and pretty easily too. I installed this myself. Um, all you need is a place for it to go out. You know, you need a window or a hole in the wall or something like that for it to be filtered out. So most people that purchase the Ventifumes love them. You can get them from Ventifume. I think it's in Buffalo and they're fabulous to work with. Really nice. Love them. Uh, is anyone going, if anyone's going to the conference, they're always there uh, and they give you a nice conference deal. So uh, is anyone going to the conference in, in June, possibly save your purchase until then. And they have them and they sell out really fast because they give you a good deal. They're fantastic. So um, other safety concerns, always have a fire extinguisher near you or a pail of sand. Um, it's vent a fume, vent a fume. Um, have a pail of sand. Now, wax cannot be extinguished with water. It's, it's basically a grease fire. So make sure that you don't try to be putting it out with water because you'll actually add fuel to the flame. Um, I have a, just a, a portable fire extinguisher right near me. I have them all around the room, actually, just because I, like I, I like to set things on fire. So um, uh, no, uh, I like to set them you know, on fire because I like, I like to burn things, you know, not set things on fire just you know, willy-nilly. Uh, so let's make that clarification. Um, 
Also, you don't want to go past 200 degrees. Uh, on some of these, I, sh I should say, on some of the cheaper griddles, you might not be getting enough heat. So I always say it's okay to go up to 225 sometimes, um, but most of the time you don't wanna go up past 200. I always say start at 200. If it's not melting or something's going on, it's cooling too quickly, turn it up to 225, it's fine. Um, my studio is not heated. So my wax is always cooling off really fast. So in the winter, I have to go up to 225. It's fine to do that. If your wax is smoking or turning brown, that's an issue. You want to turn it down immediately, get the out of the area until it cools off and then figure out what's going on. But don't be blown, don't be breathing that in. That is where it gets toxic. Everybody worries about the wax that it's toxic. It's not toxic if you are filtering the air and if you are not going beyond a certain point on your heating. So that it's not toxic right now for me. I have it actually lower than I should and and I'm fine you know it's fine I, I would filter the air if I was in here teaching or, or um, not just with myself um, your wax should never smoke never ever ever okay and it never should turn brown if that's happening that's a really bad thing for you to be breathing in okay so those are the only really the only safety things fire heat and filtering that air out all right let's get back to fusing and then we'll do some color mixing and some techniques for reworking the surface. So I'm gonna, I know I said it was gonna be an hour for the demo. The demo was actually an hour. I did a little spiel in the beginning. So probably about one, or I'm sorry, 2.30 uh, Eastern time, we will cut out for a break, okay? So I'm just letting you know what time it is. And, and I go through this pretty quickly. All right, so let's talk about how to set up a board. I, I start with just a few layers of medium. Okay, and I go across. You can heat up the board. A lot of people heat up the board beforehand. It, it does make for a nicer, smoother um, application. Okay. I like to start out with a, a layer of medium because it helps everything flow better. Uh, some people start with four layers of medium. I've heard people start with four layers of medium crazy and so not necessary. Um, the most I start with is two, all right? And I'm not putting it on thickly. That's one thing we will talk about in the Beyond the Basics class is application, okay? Like I said, one of the things that I see people doing is not working with the translucency of the wax. But another thing I see people doing is just overloading, not having enough um, dexterity or understanding of that you don't need a ton of wax in order to make things look good. Um, so understanding that you, you can put thin layers on versus thick. It's okay to use thick layers, it's great, but, it, but you should have the ability to use thin layers as well, okay? And I'm gonna use my torch to heat this up. And what I like to do for the very first layer is make it molten, all right? Make that thing molten, um, almost wet again. Get rid of some of those bubbles that come up. Might be difficult to see, I understand. Uh, virtual, it's difficult to see the bubbles, but I actually just suffocate them. I actually fuse until they disappear. You don't want your, see how I'm kind of moving things around? I'm moving it, you don't have to go like this. I see people go like this. That's not slowly. There. And when it cools, sometimes those bubbles come back. It's okay, it's okay. Those bubbles will go away. And I let it come, I let it pretty much go back to cooling a little bit. And then I put my second layer on. Um, and I go crossways with that. I went this way with the first layer. I'm going to go this way with the second layer and fuse that. And then I am ready to paint. Okay. And that's how I set up my board. Really simple. Um, there's really no, there's no trick to it at all, except to do that. Um, you guys are good. Let me see. While we're waiting for it to cool a little bit. 
Yes, thank you for answering that, Francesca, about the gesso. Yeah. Seal the back of the panel with gesso? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think you need to do that. Um, I don't know why you would need to do that. Maybe some people do. I, I don't know. I see I'm not a gesso fan, really, so I don't I don't really know too much about it. Um, oh, varnish. Yeah, I can understand with the varnish, but not necessarily. I like to write on the back. I like to write a message to the person who owns or bought the work or whatever. There's always a poem back there or something like that. So I don't I don't seal anything. Um, OK, let's go with the second layer. So as I'm talking, so some mistakes that people have, as I said, translucency is one, application is two, and three, what I'm going to go through here is fusing. Overfusing is a major mistake. You could spend, I could spend a whole class, um, and that is like an eight-hour day <laughs> on fusing, and I have pretty much done that because people do have a tendency to overfuse. Or fuse too much, it's or, or or make it too much a part of the work that they get so bogged down and fusing that they don't enjoy the painting process, and that saddens me. I think a lot of people give up uh, on encaustic because they over they tend to be too bogged down and fusing. And I call a lot of a lot of people um, on YouTube who, teachers fuse monsters because they just talk about fusing too much. And you know we're going to talk about it. It's necessary to do. Um, fusing is a bringing together of your layers. Okay, so we're putting it's what encaustic actually means. The word encaustic is to burn in. Okay, because you're always working in layers with encaustic. You're always applying in layers. So what happens when you apply in layers? Okay, here look at my hands. Is that little pockets of air are trapped between the layers? I mean, it's, can't see them, but they're there. So when we fuse the layers with heat to burn in, um, you are getting rid of that pocket of air. You're, get, you're, you're fusing those layers, you're fusing them together. Um, now, if you don't fuse or if you fuse improperly, what happens is that those, that air will want to escape at some point and your whole painting will disappear. It will crack and go away. It might take, again, it might take years, but eventually it's going to fall. Um, if anyone has been to RNF, they're in an old train station. And this is a favorite story that I like to tell, is that they, they had a gallery there um, that they got rid of, and they just brought it back, actually. But they had a gallery, and a train went by, and um, they came into the gallery, and one of the paintings literally had fallen off its base because it was not fused properly. So it's, it is necessary to fuse and especially necessary to fuse properly on these foundation layers. Okay. So again, foundation layer number two, I'm going to fuse and I'm going to, again, bring this back to molten. Okay. Right now what I'm doing by bringing it back to molten, bringing it back to shiny is I am considering this over fusing. Okay. When you bring it back to molten, it's, it's really, really getting that fused together. All right, I do this only on my foundation layers. All right, I, I only do that on my foundation layers. Anything else to bring back to molten or to wet um, is a little bit much. It's too much, I think, is too much fusing. You don't have to spend that much time and you don't have to spend, you don't have to ruin your painting. Basically, if you bring it back to molten, it's, it's swimming around. And some people like that. They really love the way that looks. That's fine just as long as you can control it and have the knowledge that you understand that you're doing it for a reason and you're doing it for your creative process. Um, some people do it because they think it's necessary and it's not, just making that clear. Most of the fusing that you'll do is what I call is a glazed donut. That's the surface of what your painting should look like when it's fused. It should have that little bit of a glaze, but not a full swimming in the pool, okay? It shouldn't look shiny. It shouldn't look wet. It should just have a glazed donut. Okay, that's most of the most of what you'll need. All right. So what you can fuse with, what you can fuse with, any of the heated tools that I talked about, you can fuse with your torch, your iron, your heat gun, 
anything hot. Uh, some people actually like to work directly on top of the griddle. They like to put uh, small panels directly on top of the griddle, turn their griddle down to 150 and work on top of that and actually have their work always moving and actually be able to move, not melted necessarily, but be able to move like oil paint, okay? Smoosh it around. Some people do that. Um, other people use the sun to fuse. Um, again, that's something that will save you on electricity. Some people like to do it in Miami, Leslie. Um, you have the hot sun. Some people work in their garage um, in, when, in the warmer weather and put their pieces out on their driveway to fuse in the sun. That's great, but make sure you're watching it, okay? Because you have no control over it and uh, the sun will just do what it does. And you could end up melting your entire um, your entire piece, which happened at a, at a workshop uh, that I was teaching. And of course I got blamed for it, but <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even know she had done it. Um, but whatever the case, uh, I do wanna say, be very vigilant and watch your work if you're doing it with the sun. Okay. Um, all right, let's get into color mixing uh, and talk about that a little bit. So, so people do this very differently. I have many different processes for doing this. So I'll be over on the palette. If you can't see the palette window, make sure you have that up and you can look at it. Some people work in cups. Some people work directly on the palette. Uh, some people have uh, tuna cans or soup cans and they melt an entire cake of color in the soup can with a brush in it. And they have all of their colors with little soup cans, like a palette, like, a, like an oil painting palette. Um, not my way of working, but again, it, to each his own. Um, so I'm going, I like working directly on the palette for most of the time. I work in the cups when I want to keep my color. All right. And, and there's certain instances where you might want to do that and keep your color. Um, most of the time I'm on the palette though. And I've, I've been working in the whites lately. Now, when I have my palette set up for painting, I usually have areas where I have the colors. Um, whites go to the back and I have my white brushes back there. Um, and I have my black brushes sort of near it. Cause I, my palette sort of dips down like this. Um, and I don't want any of the color in the white, so, or it dips down this way, sorry. I don't want any of the color in the white, so I keep the white pretty much separate and the black separate. And then all my colors are here. I do like yellow, um, blue, uh, reds over here, and yellows over here. So I keep my family, and then in the middle, I sort of mix them all together. Um, it makes for some interesting color combinations when you do that. Everything sort of swims together on the palette, and, it, and you have it going on. Uh, so some of the things you can, so let's, let's, let's mix together blues. So what I'm working with here, I got the um, Painter's Dozen from r &F. They were selling that this, this Christmas. So I'm working with some colors from there, cobalt blue and unbleached titanium, which I love. Um, also working with medium. Now I like to work with a little bit of medium always, even if, even if I'm not, I always like to have just a little bit of medium in there. It just spreads better, all right? From, from cake to paint um, is sometimes a little pasty, especially when you're getting into the whites. For some reason, they're always a little bit pasty. So just adding a little bit of medium, even if you don't want to have a glaze or something that you can see through, um, these are very pigmented colors, so you won't have any worries with that. Um, even if you add just a little bit. So I always have my family of brushes. I like working with dirty brushes. Again, a preference. I think some people get a little crazy about cleaning their brushes. I understand with oil painters, um, you always have to clean your brushes at the end of the day. With encaustic, you don't have to do that. And we'll talk about that with cleanup a little bit, but you can see I'm sort of mix the colors this way um, on the palette. And always want to have a heated surface. My heated my surface is just fine. And I always take the temperature, always with my hand, always making sure that it's warm, and just kind of applying. And I kind of flip my brush as I work. Now this is, I think this yeah this is a bristle brush. 
So this is not a hakey brush. So I'm getting a little bit of texture in it. Also texture can occur when you don't have a heated, a brush that's heated enough or a surface that's heated enough. A lot of people get texture and they, they get very concerned about it and they don't understand why they're getting it. And those are the reasons why not enough heat either on the surface, on the brush or the paint. All right, so th that's, your, that's your tip of the day. Um, Again, I like working with dirty brushes because you get some interesting combinations of color that can happen. This is a hakey brush and it doesn't have enough paint on it. That's another reason, not enough paint on your brush. You really want your brush to have a lot of paint on it. I'm gonna put some more medium down, some paint. Down. And again, I keep my families of color you know, like this is the orange side, this is the cooler side. Sometimes it just all mushes together and I don't care. So that was a alizarin orange. My, another one of my favorite colors. It just kind of has the most beautiful, see how golden that looks? It has a really, really nice range. And there's another lighter golden of it. If I keep adding, you can see this swim. I love that. Um, if I keep adding medium, I will be creating a glaze. And this is when you start to get into the beauty of encaustic. Now I'm probably I'm going to keep my medium over here, in the corner, so that I have my glaze over here, more of the pigmented area over here. For some reason, it's flowing, and I really got to fix that. I want it to be a little bit more stable than that. So you'll have to test this with your own palette, but a lot of times these palettes are not, are not flat and neither is my house. <laughs> my house is very old and, oh, look at that. That's gorgeous. So this is a glaze. Um, so we really get into this in Beyond the Basics. We talk about glazing and working with uh, and I give you some exercises on how to mix paint and um, how to really how to really expand on your ability to to work um, with your translucency. So there you go. Now I have a couple layers on here. I will fuse them, but I usually don't fuse. And again, this is your I, I fuse to get a lot of the texture out, the brush stroke out. And that's it. You really don't have to go too much further than that. You don't have to go again back to molten. Doing just the glazed donut is fine. Or if there's unwanted texture, uh, fusing until you get rid of that texture is fine. All right. So let's talk about other application methods brought besides the brush. You can work with plaster tools. This is a Venetian plaster tool. If you look that, that's actually on Amazon as well. You can apply lots of color. At, this, at one time with, with a brush, you can do uh, really only one, but this is, and you can also get some really interesting texture with it. Um, silicone tipped tools like catalyst tools are really great. These are silicone tipped. They do kind of the same thing, allow you to kind of smear the color on. Also working in cups allows you to pour a little bit easier. If you have color in the cups, make sure you stir it because the pigment gets really, gets down there and does not come back up unless you stir it. I always make a little spout and then I put pour. You can do some really fun things with pouring. There we go. And just kind of play with it this way. <laughs> Sometimes you get really frustrated with a painting Pouring is the best thing. You just pour a bunch of stuff on it and see what happens. Also, um, splatter, you know, splattering your brush. Any kind of paint, things that you do with regular paint, you can do with encaustic pretty much and more. Uh, what else? Uh, dripping, all the stuff. Also, I like to use my iron, um, which I didn't turn on, I forgot to turn on. Um, as a kind of a palette knife where I would just melt it on and kind of go like this. So you can kind of do something like that too. So lots of different tools. Those are the basic, basic things to do. So 
what else? So once you have a bunch of layers on, um, scraping is the most fabulous thing that you can do um, with it. You can, and I'm going to get another another thing here that I can work with. That has scrap. Scraping is one of the things that I think really separates encaustic from any other medium. You can certainly scrape with acrylics. You can scrape with, I think even with oil paints. Um, but what, what makes encaustic so fabulous in scraping is that you're not, you have dimensions still. Um, with, with acrylics and scraping, you're scraping on flat to flat, basically, unless you're using some really fancy mediums. Um, but with with encaustic, it's it's a softer surface. You can scrape with your hand. It's almost like carving. Um, and if you look at if you read my blog, which I will send you uh, links to, um, I do a, a comprehensive articles on scraping and and how to create uh, composition through scraping. So this was a demo board that I was uh, that I did that has a lot of layers on it and and some of the scraping tools that you might want to use. I'm going to fuse this. Uh, I mean, it was fused. I'm just going to warm it up a little bit. Some of the basic scraping tools that you'll want. I did talk about a little bit is the razor blade. Um, the pear shaped or triangular shaped clay scraper. And this is one of, this is my favorite tool. This you get from Encausticos. It's the double-ended scraper tool. Um, you can also get these uh, Kemper tools, um, has something similar, but it's not double-ended. Uh, Encausticos is the only place that I know that makes this. And you can buy this on Amazon too, uh, through Encausticos on there. And again, there's a link on my store for it. But I, different scraping methods yield different things. So if I use the, the razor blade, I'm only gonna take a very thin skin off. And this is, this is very zen when you're using this, you just wanna kind of get in the mood and do some deep breathing. And you just taking off a little bit of a layer, but it changes ever so drastic, ever so slightly when you are using the razor blade and and each swipe of the razor blade, even if it's slight, changes your composition. So fabulous. Um, things like your pores, things like this that if I covered over uh, and then pulled that up, kind of uh, really gives. So adding a pour, this might not look really great right now, but if I added some more color on top of it and then scraped it back, that would be really fascinating, which is what's going on in here. This was a pour right here. And you can see it's coming up just ever so slightly there. So um, this will give you a, you know, pretty much, you know, you're hacking at it and you're taking out a little bit more at a time than you would with the razor blade. Okay, and you can see this area starting to come up. This is where you get all of your, uh, this is where I have most of my fun with encaustic is the scraping part because there are things in there that are, I really didn't control. The only thing that I controlled was really the colors that I put down and the order that I cut, put down. All the drips and all the texture and things like that are hidden under there. And I'm, I don't even know they're there until I bring them up. Um, and, you know, I have people in my Beyond the Basics class that spend most of the time scraping. They just get so into it, you know, because it is a, a fascinating thing to do. So, and then I go in with my detailer in here and kind of carve around. And we talk about this, like I said, in depth in the Beyond the Basics class, um, you know, because it is such a fabulous part of encaustic. Again, with the retreats also, you get all of this. Um, if you are not feeling up to, to par and to take a retreat, don't feel bad about that. I had beginners that hadn't even picked up a brush ever an encaustic brush in the retreats last year. And because they are so hands-on and because you are um, so close together, you'll learn. So don't feel like you can't take a retreat uh, if you're just a beginner. We take anybody. So, um, but you, but the Beyond the Basics virtual will give you all of this, uh, all of this in depth. So I can get into scraping forever. 
So it's really a fascinating and fun thing to do. Um, you can also, at this point too, you can incise. So we'll talk about incising. Uh, once you have layers, and I say, when you want to start to scrape and incise and things like that is when you get about five to 10 layers on. And again, those layers don't have to be all over the surface of your entire painting. They can be five to 10 layers at one point, And maybe there are five layers here. Maybe there are eight layers here. Maybe there are 10 layers there. So you don't have to be working on the entire surface of the painting at all times. You need to fuse after scraping? No, you don't need to fuse because you're not applying more paint. Application of paint is, is when you need to fuse because again, that you're, you're having small area air trapped between the layers and then you need to fuse those together. Scraping, you're actually squishing them down uh, in, some, in some instances. The only time you need to apply heat when you're scraping is if it's not hot enough, if you're getting, if it's too tough. To, to scrape. You saw that I heated it up just a tad before I started scraping because it was cold and it's, it's hard to scrape, really hard to scrape. So, um, and sometimes you, want, you might want cold scraping. You know, in my articles, I talk about the cold scraping versus warm scraping versus hot scraping. You get very frustrated if it's too hot. Uh, I don't like scraping in the summer. It's, it's really annoying because uh, it gums up and, and ugh, it's awful. So, um, that's just a little bit of scraping. Let's go back to this guy. And we'll talk about uh, stencils a little bit. So more things that you can do when you're applying paint, other things that you can do besides splashing and pouring and all that kind of stuff is adding stencils or masks. Basically a stencil, what a stencil is, is openings and areas of openings that allow for the paint and areas of closed that that prevent the paint from going to the surface okay so even if this netting this very very light netting is a stencil basically it has closed areas where the paint is not going to go and has open areas where the paint is going to go so stencils can be something like this or they can be decorative like this uh, any kind of mesh is a stencil. They can be doilies, um, fabric doilies, things like that that you can use as stencils. So you can get a lot of great texture by having stencils as you're as you're in continuing the painting process. So I can just kind of put my stencil down and just do a loose going over. And I can do something like this where I really concentrate on one area and then loosely just focus on another. And my paint all mixed together and turn to a odd green. I really need to fix that and make that a little bit. So I kind of, sometimes if I really want the stencil to show up the design of the stencil, I will kind of focus on pushing the paint into those areas. Other times I just like it loose, like in this in this particular consideration, I just kind of like it loose and you just kind of pull up and it will pick up some great detail. Also, this is dirty. I don't, you know, it's got a lot of colors on it, which I kind of like. I, again, I like having that odd mixture of color that I really didn't intend to be there um, with my dirty brushes and my dirty stencil. So some of you might be so grossed out. Oh my God, she's so dirty. but I'm not, <laughs> I'm actually kind of clean uh, in my studio. I get criticized by certain artists that I'm too clean. I won't, I won't mention any of those names, but um, they talk about me behind my back, apparently. Anyway, I am neat and clean, but I like, I like my dirt when I like it. So if I go over this with like a white or something lighter, get some interesting things happening. I think I started to talk about incising and I just kind of skipped over it. Uh, any sharp tool you can incise with. And when you go over again, any incision or cut into the wax with wax applied over that incision will fill in with that color that you've applied over. So if I kind of go over this with white, I really 
really love my whites. Any white. And sometimes, again, you want to push it in there. That's interesting. And then when you scrape back, you will expose that. And we'll do a little bit of that in a second. So let me just kind of get over, go over this mesh. So I have a lot of colors there. And I only, you know, this is what I love about working with dirty brushes and kind of mixing up my colors a little bit is that I have, I use three colors. I use blue, orange, and titanium, uh, ble unbleached titanium. And look at all the colors I have here. Oh, I also use the orange. Oh, I said that already. Yeah. So yeah, you get a ton of color. And now I have a mauve over here, a beige. Um, some kind of dirty green, interesting colors that you can get just from using three. And that's another thing people get really involved in. It's so expensive to buy the paint, you have to buy all these colors. No, you don't. You know, that's when we talk about color mixing and beyond the basics is, is um, you don't need to buy a lot of paint. Uh, you can get a lot of different colors out of just three colors or five colors. So see me, I'm scraping back, back to that incised line. And look, it's coming right back up. It filled in with that color. This is called inlay. And you could choose to scrape all the way back or just kind of expose that line a little bit. Uh, same thing with the mesh. It inlaid that third beigey color kind of inlaid into the lines. And that's how I get pattern in the work. And you can do this with all different kinds of meshes and all different kinds of inlay. And you have a lot of things going on uh, all at once. I also kind of keep these, my scraping. Sometimes I keep them in a big pile. That's a good idea to do. Or just melt them back down on the palette. OK, so stenciling masks. All right, we're almost done here. And I'll just do um, collage, and then we'll just talk about uh, cleanup and storage. All right, so last thing is collage. I'm going to use my iron for this. Um, I have a special way of, of collaging that most people do not use. Um, what you'll find on YouTube is people collaging with their torches or their heat guns. And what they're doing, and, and it causes a lot of frustration. That's another thing that I find with beginners is they don't get their collage right because um, it's not taught. The only, I'm the only one that I know of that uses an iron. And I was made fun of a lot by Richard at YarnF in the very beginning when I, uh, 20 years ago when I started working in encaustic, he was like, what are you using that little iron for? It's for, it's for collage because what happens is, and those of you who probably tried this already know, you get a blur or you use the heat gun to diffuse it and it pop your collage piece pops up and you can't get it to lay flat. That's because you're not, you're blowing air into it when you use the heat gun or the torch. You're blowing air in there, so it's gonna pop up. So you're gonna end up with frustration after frustration after frustration. So in the Beyond the Basics class, I get into very, very uh, in-depth collage because people like to take my classes for that reason because my collage is so well done. They say it's well done. I'm not blowing smoke up my own butt. So you wanna start out with a very flat area for your collage and place it down where you want it to go. So it's heat, the area is heated, it's also flat, all right? Some people go as far as to scrape the area. I don't do that. I, I use the iron, so it's already flat and pretty good. I then use my fingers to kind of burnish it, okay? And then I'm going to, here's where your application is really important. I'm gonna use a thin layer of medium. You don't need a lot of medium. If you're working with collage, you can always add more, but if you cut, if you need to scrape back, if you've applied too much and you need to scrape back, you might end up scraping your collage up. So applying thin application of medium is good to know how to do. Okay, and then I just fuse it with the iron. Okay, and I talk about application and, and 
of the wax and learning how to do that in depth in all of my classes because I see people doing it, making that mistake all the time. And then I just fuse it and there you go. It's flat, it's down, it's not popped up. I can then do things on top of it if I want to. Um, oh, one thing I do wanna talk about with collage is other things. Um, tracing paper is a wonderful thing to collage into the work. Um, because any mark that's on it, you can see on this tracing paper, there is some watercolor on here. You can also draw on it with pencil or whatever. Embedding the tracing paper, actually, actually, I'm going to use white. I use yellow tracing paper when I'm working with wood, and I use white tracing paper when I'm working on a white background. There is a difference, a reason for that. Because anything that is on the tracing paper, like this watercolor, will will pop up and pop out or if, or if I drew on it the pencil the paper itself gets um soaks up all the oil in the wax and therefore becomes invisible and any mark that's on the paper gets darker and sort of gets gets more pronounced so I'm going to iron this area out so it's a little bit flat and warm And you saw me take the temperature of my surface, make sure that uh, my surface was warm first. And I like to rip my paper too, just because I don't like harsh lines of the cut. And burnish it. Now this is really crinkly tracing paper. It's pain in the butt, it's old. It's been sitting around my studio for a while. I always recommend going with flatter papers something that's not a pain in the butt to work with, like this is. And then I'm gonna do the same thing. I burnished with my fingers. Now I'm going to apply wax over top, clear medium over top and fuse that down. And you'll see the paper start to begin to absorb that oil in the wax and just disappear. Back in the day, when I started working in caustic, I was extremely poor and could not afford color. So I worked with just medium uh, most of the time, and I bought like white and red, <laughs> black uh, paint when I had some money. Um, but I worked with just medium, and I was coloring on on tracing paper. That's how color got into my work was through the tracing paper. I didn't use encaustic paint. Um, so if you're really kind of want to do this on the cheap, you can work with a lot of different colored papers or collage and, and just medium for a while. All right, and there it goes. So you can see it kind of disappeared. It's a little sloppy because it's because it's crinkly and crepey paper, but um, yeah, there it goes. So there you go. There's collage. So Let's see. Oh, there's a lot going on in the chat. Okay, I'll, I can answer some of these questions after we take a break, but let me just talk really quickly about, um, oh, thank you, Francesca. Um, I like cleanup and storage. So for cleanup, again, I don't clean my brushes. If you want to clean your brushes, have at it. I usually keep you can see my brushes over here. I don't know if you can see them on the, in the container. But um, I keep a family of brushes. I always keep certain, I keep the white brushes white as much as I can. Um, and if I dirty them up, I usually take a clean one out and use for white. I keep my black brushes separate and I keep my medium brushes separate. Okay, my medium brushes are always in my medium. They don't come out and they never go onto the palette. I have a separate little palette for my medium. You can see it right here. It's a little six by six inch skillet that I got at Walmart. Um, I think I put that on the, I think that's also on the um, encaustic uh, Amazon store, but I don't remember. Anyways, if you want to clean your brushes, you can get brush cleaner. You could use soy wax also works really well. And basically what you're going to do is you're going to get one of these, oh boy, just a scraper like this, a silicone scraper. And you kind of just 
squeeze out onto your palate all the excess. Okay. You can work right on, put it right onto the palate, or sometimes I've seen people like um, squeeze it into the drip thing. I, 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 that, that's a waste for me. I, I think it's a waste. And then this, once it's all the excess is out, I heat it up into a cleaner area and then kind of do this onto a paper towel until it's clean. Then I dip it into the soy wax or the paraffin or the brush cleaner. Okay, brush cleaner um, you can get from, from our RNF actually sells it. It is a mixture, I believe, of paraffin and soy wax together. It's called RNF's brush cleaner. Dip it in there and then you just keep going like this until it comes clear onto the paper towel. You'll never get, some of the color will never come out. It will never come off. It just stays on there permanently and uh, it just stains, basically just stains. So, but it, but it, like reds, I hardly ever get reds out. I can't do it when I'm cleaning. This is why I don't clean. <laughs> I don't clean my brushes. It's just, it's a pain in them, but you can just let them cool off and they'll be fine. They don't get degraded. Like if you left oil paint on your brushes, they would degrade and, and die. You know, you're, you'd have to get new brushes every day. But with, with wax, you're never gonna get the wax out. You're never going to be able to use those brushes for anything else besides wax. And when they cool, when the paint cools onto the, to the brush, it's not going to be doing anything bad to it anyway. So there's no reason to clean your brushes uh, unless, of course, you like to start with clean brushes all the time. And that's, that's your thing. That's, that's fine. Uh, so that's clean up of the brush. Of the surface of your griddle, I usually just take a piece of paper and make a monoprint <laughs> out of it. And that's why, you know, it's so much fun to make monoprints. I just get some cheap paper. Uh, here's some, and just kind of like put the paper down or, and you know, there you got a monoprint and it's kind of fun to, to make these sort of card sized monoprints. You can also, um, if you, if you need to clean it right away, I have shop towels. I don't know if you could see them in the corner. They look like that. They're blue and you can buy these at Walmart anywhere. Um, and I just kind of clean it up, turn it down so you don't burn yourself. I wad it up so it's, you know, but if there's an area that really needs to come clean and you do that, you can sprinkle some brush cleaner or paraffin down. Paraffin, I just, I have a ton of paraffin. I just kind of rub it over the surface. Paraffin actually acts as a vacuum for pigment. It just you, like cleans it up. Soy wax does the same thing. Okay, and you don't want to paint. Some people ask me if they paint with soy wax. No, no, it's not for painting. Soy wax is slippery and slimy and, and not good, not good. And it doesn't have a great, uh, it has a very low melting point. So it, it, it's not good for painting. Don't do it. A lot of people like the clearness of it and the, the, just the crystal clearness of soy wax. And yes, that is beautiful. And paraffin too has the same kind of crystal clear, but it's not good for painting. Um, storage of your, okay, so. We cleaned up brushes, griddle. Let's talk about storage of your paints. Um, I keep mine in a in drawers. You can see here. Um, I found this cabinet. This is the best thing I ever found on Craigslist. Um, and it's there. The paint should be dust free. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> it's dirty and gross, but I, I you know, I really like it. Um, so it, it's dust free. That's what you want to be worried about. It's not necessarily light fastness that you need to worry about like you do with other paints. Um, it's, it's dust. So I keep them in a drawer out of the, out of the air. Um, uh, what else? Storage of your paintings. That's the last thing. Keep them in your living area. Don't put them into like a storage locker outside because then they're susceptible for the, to, to the sun, to freezing. Actually, freezing is worse for your encaustic paintings than heating is, than the melting. Melting will ruin them, obviously. But in some most cases, they will not drip to the, you know, drip melt. They'll get tacky and they might slide a little bit, but you can fix them. If your paintings have frozen, they're dead. 
Pretty much the paint, the wax has, what it does is it contracts the wax. And then when it thaws out, that wax has permanently changed. And um, I've had paintings that people have brought to me to fix that have melt, that have frozen. And then they brought back to me that have cracked and that's what'll happen, it'll crack that. And then I need to fix the crack. They're very, I fixed them, but I can feel the difference in the wax. It's, it's uh, brittle. And um, they're fine, they're fine, but almost unworkable. They're very difficult to work with. So I just wanna let you know, some people think, oh, if I put it in the cold, it'll be fine. If I leave it in the cold shed outside, it'll be fine. Um, it's away from this and that, but no, you keep it in your living space, keep it in your, like a closet or something like that in your living space, or uh, maybe a, you can keep them in the basement if your basement stays pretty temperature. Um, you know, moderate. Uh, so there's that. So I also cover mine, last thing, I also cover mine with um, parchment paper, not wax paper, because if there's any instance of it melting, that wax paper is going to stick right to that surface, okay? Parchment paper, just baking parchment, is the best thing to wrap your, your paintings in. A lot of people wrap them in wax paper, but don't do that. I actually had mine, um, I had actually had mine, uh, I gave it to a gallerist and she had put it in her car wrapped in wax paper and it melted and and the whole piece of wax paper melted into the painting and I had to I fixed it I had to extract it like you know, surgically remove the wax paper from the surface so that's kind of nasty but anyways so um I have a lot I see a lot of questions coming up here so why don't you take five minutes? Uh, it's 2.40 right now. We'll come back at 2.45 and I will begin to answer these questions. Just, you know, bathroom break, um, water break, uh, take a break and I can kind of go through these and see what I have. I can also, I'm gonna also invite you to unmute yourself one person at a time uh, to ask questions if you have not asked them in the chat, okay? All right, so I will come back at 2.45. And if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. It's a little bit more organized.
Okay, so I'm back uh, answering the first question that I didn't answer that I see that I did not answer already. Um, if adding mixed media, do you need to bring back to molten? I'm not quite sure what you mean by mixed media, maybe drawing and things like that. I'm not quite sure. So could you? That was, that was me. Um, <laughs> like if you're adding something thick, like mm -hmm. say you want to put a book cover or something on, would mm -hmm. it still be a thin layer on top and the bottom? Because um medium. Like, like like something really like a cardboard or something like that yeah yeah that's a whole other different kind of way of collaging that's like bricolage um, okay I, I consider bricolage yeah that's that's a little bit more in depth than i can get into here okay but i do go through that and someone else had asked about 3d like pressed flowers that was also like that. me because i'm a big mixed media person yeah I get into that. That's a whole other thing. And I get into that in the uh, Beyond the Basics class. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, that would take, it takes a while to go through it all. Okay, I might yeah, be yeah. good for that because yeah. I'm really into, I'm one yeah, of the I do four. a whole two hours on collage. Um, uh, you know, we talk about what I talked about here. I talk a little bit more about the irons and different kinds of irons and things like that. Because I took a collage class and she did the heat gun and I had a lot of bubbling things. So yeah, like now, I mean, you're the, going to. now I'm like, oh, um, yeah. iron. Going yeah. to. Anybody you're going to. Um, that, and I, I, I know that people can do, you know, people can get it down to the, how they do it, how they like it. And some people can do it really, really well. And um, without, you know, popping it up and things. But I've noticed it always happens because you're introducing the air, you know, it's, it's, you're fighting, you're constantly fighting the air. So. Okay. Well, um, maybe I, I yeah. might take that class then. Okay. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'll send you guys all a link. And again, it's, it's uh, $50 off of the virtual one coming up in April and it's a hundred dollars off Kelly Malukas's Vermont retreat and Leah McDonald's Vermont retreat July and August and I'll send you the links to those um, those are fabulous you learn a lot more you know a lot more about specifically what we're doing the photography in Leah's and the um, abstracting the landscape but we also get all of this plus anything else that you want to talk about I mean we really kind of give it and and both of those classes we give individual talks between you know you can talk about portfolios and things like that I do it in the beyond the basics class as well I give everybody an individual 30 minute meeting so um, we can talk about anything in that meeting so uh, is your board cool or warm when you start scraping? Again, there's differences in temperature, cool scraping versus warm scraping versus hot scraping. And there are differences for why you would use each one. Um, <laughs> thank you, Francesca, love the dirt. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> It's it's fun and it relieves you. I mean, when I tell people they don't have to clean their brushes, some people just faint because they're just like, oh my God, I've been worrying about that for so much. I, I could just take my brushes and I don't have to clean them, no. Um, do you put the side with the watercolor or whatever you draw on the paper down on the board or could it go see with the tracing paper it doesn't matter because it can go. That's why I like using tracing paper because you can draw words and reverse you know whatever if you want to so. Um, it doesn't matter what side goes down or up uh, if you're worried about smearing anything you probably want to put that side down, you know, um, but no it doesn't really matter. Do I use hand gloves with encaustic? Oh, I did, and during the safety thing, I forgot to talk about this. This is barrier cream. If you're worried about toxicity, which you don't really have to be, these are cadmiums though. So like any paint, they will go into the skin if you get them on your hands. Um, you know, most of the time when it's on my hands, I'm scraping and it's cold. So it's not molten and it's not warm. It's not seeping into my skin. So, um, but you could put a layer of barrier cream on. Don't use gloves. Gloves, you know, the disposable kind, they're made out of rubber or latex. If they melt, that's gonna melt to your skin. It's gonna burn to your skin. That's really painful. And, you know, if that's ever happened to you, it's really painful. So, um, because it's there on your skin, you, you're wanting to pull it off. And if you do that, you're gonna pull up your skin. So um, it's really kind of, it, it's happened uh, 
a couple times to people. So this is the key, this is the ticket, barrier cream if you're worried about uh, toxicity of paint. Um, and also any kind of paint, you can use it with oils or acrylic. You just put it on your hand like hand cream. Uh, okay, what kind of paper did I use for the small mono print? Use oil paper. Um, I think Arches makes it. Arches oil paper comes in pads or you could buy single sheets too. Um, why is it important to keep the pigment blacks dust free? Well, dust. <laughs> It gets trapped up in there. I mean, you certainly could clean off your blocks, but if it has dust on it and then you go and you melt it and then you paint with that dust, then your dust is in your in your work. But you're you know, you're always fighting dust when you're painting anyway, and you're always fighting impurities in the air anyway. It just cuts down on it. That's all. Um, okay, yeah, we, the dimension I'll, oh, you can't. That's too much. Um, good. I'm glad you had good. It seems like everybody has enjoyed this. The name of the barrier cream that I have here is um, SBS 46 Protective Cream Solvent Resistant. S, put it here. SBS 46 Protective Cream. You can get this. I bought it online because I couldn't find it, but I think you can get it at Home Depot and Lowe's. I think they have that somewhere in the paint area. Um, oh, good. Love the retreat. Oh, the November Georgia retreat. Um, not doing it this coming year, but possibly doing it in 2023. Um, that was fabulous. It was with my friend, um, who lives in New Orleans. Oh, oh, the November, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I looked at GA and I, I, New Orleans is on the brain. Um, yeah, the November Georgia retreat in um, Fountainhead. Yes, coming up in November. Um, actually haven't been thinking about it to be quite honest with you. I don't even remember what class, it's a, it's a mixed media fiber, I believe, right? I'm so sorry. I should have this in my brain, like buried in my brain, but it's in November and I don't even think about it until, um, you know, like September. But let me look it up first. Let me see what it is. Okay. Yes, abstract mixed media. Um, that will be very much like um, the abstracting the landscape, but it's not gonna be abstracting the landscape. We're gonna talk a lot about abstraction. We're gonna talk about um, a lot about scraping and composition and color. So it's kind of gonna be uh, kind of like beyond the basics, but you know, we'll talk a little bit about collage, a little bit of this, a little bit. It's just basically expanding on what we're talking about here, but we're gonna be talking more about abstraction and more about breaking things down. Um, and we'll do that, uh, you know, either with the work that you're working with um, now in your studios. I have sometimes have people bring actual work with them. Um, but we also are going to talk a lot about mark making in that class too, mixed media mark making things, working with things like Woody's um, making line, uh, using horsehair, you know, things like that in that class as well. So um, talking about how the color and the form and then the line come together to form the um the composition so that's basically basically it beginner ish not really um uh, in that class it's not beginner it well i always have beginners in any class i take whether it's advanced or whether it's not i always have beginners in my classes um and and I take them aside usually. And what I tell people, if they're a beginner, yes, you can take an advanced class because I take you aside and I basically show you um, fusing and things like that. And most people who call themselves beginners aren't because they've been watching YouTube videos. They've taken a thing like this and um, they know stuff. They just haven't done it. So, you know, that's basically what it is. And most of the time people who are taking um, beginner classes or taking advanced classes are what I would consider inner, you know, just above a beginner or an intermediate. So don't be, I think if you, if you know stuff, 
and you've seen it a lot on YouTube and maybe you've even tried a little bit, you're, you're, you're a beginner, yes, because you don't have a, a, a portfolio of work or whatever, but you know stuff, you know enough and you can begin at an advanced level. I think it's better sometimes to study with people who have a little bit more of experience than you have because you learn at, at that level. And I always take people, beginners aside, um, if you've never picked up a brush of any kind before, if you have, are just coming on cold to the art scene, I don't recommend taking an advanced class, you know? But most, like I said, most people who are taking an advanced and costed class know something about it and they've seen it being worked and they have tried it even themselves. So I don't consider that person a beginner. Um, so I hope that explains that. And I think I've answered everything. I, I hope I didn't skip over anyone's questions. Um, if I have, please type it in real quick so I can see it at the bottom. I think I went through and uh, answered every question <clears throat> that people had. Um, I'm used to being isolated in my studio all day. Now I'm losing my voice because I'm talking. Um, I do have paints and brushes for regular paints. Okay, that's fine. Uh, direct message. Um, okay, good. One last question. Sure. No, I mean, if you have questions, please ask them. Um, okay, I'm waiting for it to come in. It's not coming yet. So I hope you all enjoyed this. Um, can you use any natural fiber brush? Yes, any natural fiber. And I, sorry, I didn't stress that. Don't use uh, anything synthetic. <laughs> That'll melt and it'll, or it'll get burned. Um, Anything that is natural fiber will work. Yeah. Sometimes things tend to, if they're too soft, like a squirrel brush, I think, you know, tends to come off in the work. But, you know, you could try your hand at anything um, a horse hair brush, a horse bristle brush. Also, I want to talk about, oh, I forgot to talk about um, Elizabeth's shower, I think it, Elizabeth's shower shirt, shirt, shower shirt. I think that's how you say her name. She makes the most fabulous brushes ever. And she's got a whole line of encaustic stuff. They're gorgeous. Um, she makes them from bamboo handles. Some of the things she makes are from antiques. I have a whole bunch of her, her brushes um, go on to her. I will put her link also in my um, email back to you because I can never say her name right. And it's difficult, but if you're looking for some interesting brushes or some interesting natural hair brushes to try, um, she's, she's the person to try that with. Um, if I need to throw away some encaustics I have in my art studio, very cold temperatures, no, don't throw them away. Um, do, where, did they freeze? If they froze, do you mean encaustic paints or encaustic paintings? If the, if the paintings themselves froze, you don't have to throw them away. Just try to, if they're cracked, try to fix them, but um, not frozen paints. That's fine. My, it's, my studio gets very cold too. I don't have heat up here. So um, I'm talking about, yeah, to try to fix them. If they cracked, try to fix them. But like I said, the, the, the wax feels different. It feels different. It's just not as workable. Um, I wouldn't throw away your, don't throw away your paintings, um, unless they're really bad. Um, I, I fixed it. It was just for a collector. The gallerist had, you know, really melted the painting. Uh, she actually, the painting froze, then melted, then froze again, then melted again. And then it went through this series of melting and freezing in her, uh, in her garage. And that's what had happened to the painting with me. And I, I, I was like, what did you do? And the, and the wax paper was squished to it and it was cry, it was crazy. But I, I fixed it enough that it, it was able to go back to the collector. And um, I don't know what happened to it after that. <laughs> I think it's fine. It just felt different. I just can't describe it. But after it freezes, it feels weird. You're welcome, everybody. Um, is anyone doesn't... Nobody has any other questions. I'm going to sign off. Um, it was wonderful to see some of you. Some of you I know, some of you I don't know. Um, I hope you got enough out of this and I will send you a, a wrap up email. Again, you have until a week from today to sign up with your discounts um, for anything that you like to sign up for. Um, I probably maybe I overwhelmed you with enough stuff. <laughs>
here. <laughs> okay, everybody. Bye-bye.